you can use the dark to get into the light. And I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of, you know, light and love, light and love, and everything is beautiful and all of this. But yes, it can be. But the true work, I believe, and, and what I teach is actually knowing how to work with the darkness, to go, to be bold enough and go and reclaim your power. Take back what you have given. That was B. Bosnak, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Dharma Talkers, thanks for checking out the podcast. I'm glad you're here, wherever here may be. I'm recording this intro from Austin, Texas, but by the time it hits the airwaves, I'll be in Bali. But that's the cool thing about podcasting and technology, isn't it? We can be connected no matter where and when we are in time and space. Real quick, do you want to advance your yoga practice with a systematic process? Check out the Henry Yoga app. I've designed a 40 day, 40 minutes daily curriculum that includes Hatha Vinyasa classes and workshops to take you deeper. Go get the first two classes free at henryyoga.com. All right, yogis, it's all love and light, right? No, according to my guest this week, B. Bosnak, the true work in being human is to go straight into the darkness, face our fears and shine the light there to remember what it is that we've forgotten. This week, we're talking about how to address the root causes of our pain and our blocks. We touch on shamanism, energy medicine, shadow work, and other methods to address the spirit, which really is the only way to fundamentally resolve our mental, emotional, and physical dis-ease. Do y'all know B? I invited her on the show way back in episode 27, and last I checked, it's still the number one most downloaded episode in the history of Dharma Talk. So the people have spoken. That episode is very valuable. Go check that out if you haven't heard it already. I wanted to bring her back on the show to continue the conversation around doing the work and how her understanding of what the work is that is the effective work to get to the root of what ails us and how it's evolved. In effect, what it takes to heal yourself. This episode is brought to you in part by Rainbow, my favorite sustainable mushroom company offering medicinal foods and supplements to elevate body, mind, and spirit. If you know me, you know I'm all about that mushroom lifestyle, and the folks behind Rainbow are fueled by an even higher level of obsession. They already nailed it with the 1111 tincture, which I've been using for months now, not only to stimulate my focus and creativity, but also to boost my immune system. It's a non-psychoactive medicinal mushroom tincture with reishi, chaga, cordyceps, lion's mane, turkey tail, shiitake, oyster, royal sun, agaricon, maitake, and mesima. Yeah, the gang's all here. But now they've just released a new product called Forest Juice, which is essentially the purest Canadian maple syrup you can find infused with all the adaptogenic medicinal mushrooms of the forest's healing ecology. They recommend sweetening your coffee or tea with it, but to be candid, I just take it by the shot and it's delicious. So are you ready to feed your inner rainbow? Go to rainbow.com and use code HENRYWINS for 15% off your order. Once again, that's rainbow, R-A-I-N-B-O, no W, dot com and use code HENRYWINS for 15% off your order of the 1111 and or the forest juice. Full disclosure, this brand is not a paid sponsor, but I am an affiliate, meaning when you order their products, I'll earn a small commission for sending you their way. So if you'd like to support the show, you can buy one of the items I recommend, and you'll not only receive a high quality product, but also know that you're helping to keep Dharma Talk up and running. As far as other ways to support, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, which helps more than you know with discoverability, or make a direct financial contribution at henrywins.com slash donate. 
I've got one more announcement for you this week, which is that Veronica, my wife, and I are gearing up for a tour, a little mini tour through Europe in January through early February 2020. We're going to be at the Yoga Garage in Florence, Studio Geotir in Milan, Anahata Yoga Studio in Thessaloniki, Greece, and Hara Yoga Studio in Barcelona. So check out the details for that little tour at henrywins.com slash events and sign up if you're in the area. Now back to the show. You may already know B, but in case you don't, B Bosnak at B Bosnak on Instagram is a New York City based healer, teacher, mentor, and the creator of Heal Yourself, a method that merges shadow work, somatic studies, sound, yoga, and meditation to connect with spirit and heal past trauma. B has been studying the human condition for the past decade and continues to study philosophical and psycho spiritual aspects of the practice from various disciplines. Her transformational and heartfelt Heal Yourself workshops and retreats around the globe give her students the courage to take back their power, lean into discomfort, and learn how to rise with bravery. If you love this episode, if you want to go deeper with B, first of all, check out her other episode, episode 27, and also go to dharmatalk.show and type B in the search bar. B-E-E. And you're going to find all the notes, highlights with timestamps, and links for this episode. That's also an easy way for you to find B's first episode on Dharma Talk, where she shared her recommended book. As always, if you're looking for another book to read, remember that I keep a running list of all the books ever recommended on Dharma Talk. So you can head over to henrywins.com slash books and just pick one out. Now, without further ado, please enjoy my follow-up interview with B. Bosnak. B. Bosnak, back on Dharma Talk for round number two. B, how are you today? I'm well, Henry. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to come back. I'm so pleased that you're back. And for those who didn't catch the last time, know that you can go check out um, B's first interview on Dharma Talk. That was episode number 27, where she talks about um, her understanding of Dharma. And we get into some, uh, some exercises that you can use to explore personal boundaries. And we talk a lot about the whole idea of healing yourself, which is kind of signature to what you're all about, right, B? Pretty much, yes. Healing, you know, from from the inside out. Right. Well, since something that I've uh, frequently had come up with these conversations is that Dharma is, in fact, not a static arrival point, but an evolution. First, why don't we start there? How has your understanding of your role to play or even your idea around the concept of Dharma changed since we last spoke? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like uh, life in itself. It's um, it's a, a never sort of ending evolution. So it, it's not really you know from point A to point B, but it's really about uh, the journey and and the experience of, of the journey. And uh, it's always ever changing. You know, I think um, for all of us, as we get deeper into our practice, as we start to understand things, not only just um, on an intellectual level, but more on a spiritual level, more uh, on an energetic level, the more things start to shift. Um, And this is how we start to also kind of shed skin. And we start to, you know, when people will tell you, wow, you've changed, right? Like, what are you doing? You've changed. And that I, I believe that change is, is a lot of that inner work that we are all responsible for. So, um, you know, Dharma is, it's, it's, it's this never ending journey. There is no end. It's just a constant, just a constant journey. That's what so I have you that. changed? Is it true what they say? <laughs> Yes. I mean, we're, we're changing every day. And so I believe, you know, since our last conversation, I hope I have, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I, um, I do, with the work that, you know, we do, especially being in this field is you have to, 
and because you adapt to it. And, uh, and I think, you know, um, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations so that you can grow, um, learning, studying, doing the things that maybe you thought you would never do. It really helps you to, to create that evolution. And so, yes, um, I have changed, uh, very much. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, great. Me too, I hope. Um, well, let's let's get specific about it. Um, you know, you spoke a little bit about emotional, energetic, and spiritual levels. Mm-hmm. How would you break those apart? How do you inter- or disentangle those three things and uh, define where each one ends and begins? Yeah. So what happens um, is, you know, I find in, in my work... Um, that I, I come across a lot of people who, you know, deal with um, emotional ailments, mental, physical. But I think the key and the root that we are missing in, in, in our modern modern life is is the spiritual aspect of it, is to connect with spirit. Because this, you know, energy work is spiritual work. So when we ignore the spirit, we ignore the root cause of the particular thing that we're dealing with. And that thing that we're dealing with is trauma. And trauma is part of, of, of the shadow work. And shadow work is, is work that is, um, it's a, the term shadow comes from Carl Jung's work. So it's really about getting into the unconscious. So when I work with individual clients, so say they, they have depression. Okay, so let's go, let's go backwards to the what happened. What is the root? Because when you ignore something on a spiritual level, what happens is that then it turns into the mental. So anxiety or OCD. When you ignore the mental level, it then turns into the emotional, which is depression or unable to form bonds. And then when we ignore what is happening on the emotional level, it turns into the most obvious, which is the physical. So like an autoimmune uh, disorder, a binge eating, chronic fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we go back to the root? And that is really what shadow work is, is, is something that um, I've been studying for a couple of years, especially um, recently a lot, for the, probably since the last time we, we talked about is, is um, really understanding what the shadow is and to not be afraid to go back to that trauma, dealing with the trauma in a way that is not re-traumatizing the client or the student. I see. Yeah. That's, that's a very precarious situation when we're talking about some of the things that are so foundational to our even understanding of ourselves that they affect down the pipeline from spirit to mental, to emotional, to physical. So how do we, how do we do that safely? How do we tap back into the the shadow? Well, everything that we experience, we experience it on, on an energetic level. It's, it's an energetic level that we experience it through. And so our, experience it, our experiences, we sort of filter them. Our conscious mind filters them. This is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. Right? So it sort of filters our, our conscious mind. And when you are um, looking to heal, the reason why people cannot heal is because people are not willing to connect back with the spirit. And because of a power loss, which we may get into later, but there is no power. So retrieving your power to heal. But the experience that we we have is filtered through our conscious mind. We cannot heal just by thinking. We can't think, oh, I hope I get better, or I hope this goes away. We cannot. So we have to go into the unconscious. And this is done through, through, through energy medicine. Um, and the work of, you know, um, shamanism, which is, you know, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a very, very uh, healing type of work. But the shaman's job is to uh, do the heavy lifting. So this is kind of like an applied shamanism where you use shadow work to help the client, to empower the client to heal themselves through these, of course, you know, um, techniques, um, altered state of consciousness, maybe having them journal. That's another way to get into the unconscious and to understand the psyche through yoga practice, movement practice, through, of course, meditation, um, 
So there's many, many areas that you can use to kind of go into the deep trauma to understand what the trauma is. I mean, you know, we could talk that we could talk about this for for forever because the trauma, you know, is it from this lifetime? Is it also from a past lifetime? You know, but now, you know, we're sort of going into more of the Buddhism approach, more of the, you know, incarnation and, and whatnot. But to keep it and there could be, you know, many skeptics out there. They're like, what is energy medicine? You know, but we are energy. Like that's a fact. We are energy, right? We're made of atoms and molecules and, um, and, and, and each particle of us is emanating something. It's frequency. It's, it's a vibration. So it's kind of like fine tuning the vibration when we feel very imbalanced. Right. Right. Um, to, to address the skeptics out there, I just have to say that, you know, my background is that I used to be very much like scientific prone thinker. If it's not evident through materialism, then it, it's, I have to doubt it. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even now, like w the Western scientists agree, like quantum physicists agree that if you look closely enough, microscopically, nanoscopically mm -hmm. enough, then it's only space. Like we only have the probability of knowing that a particle is in a given space at any time. Really, it's all empty space. So even even the scientists agree that we're more energy really than physical matter. So something to chew on for those who are of skeptical. Course. Absolutely. And we're seeing a lot of science. We're seeing a lot of research, especially in this, you know, in the in in this field a lot. There's a lot of research out there. Um, so I definitely, you know, it's and I'm not saying, you know, this or that. I think we have to sort of question everything um, in our lives, but um, just, you know, the work that the, the, the unconscious can really bring up for you to be able to go back to the trauma. Where did it start? Where did it begin? Because as Carl Jung would say, whatever you put into the shadow, it will run your life and you will mm. call it fate. Wow. So this That's is really powerful. about empowerment. It's really, it, it is because when you lose your power, a power loss is the loss that you cannot even get up from bed, that you, you know, you, you're in this very, very deep state of depression. You're in the dark, but the dark, again, this is not good or bad, not right or wrong. You can use the dark to get into the light. And I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of, you know, light and love, light and love, and everything is beautiful and all of this, but yes, it can be, but the true work I believe, and, and what I teach from the Heal Yourself Method is the true work is actually knowing how to work with the darkness. Yes. To go, to be bold enough and go and reclaim your power. Take back what you have given. Right. It's not, it's not light where there's already light. The, the guru is what brings lightness into where there is darkness. That's the important work. The illumination true. itself. True. So you mentioned several different tactics or ways that we can go and illuminate the shadow, but what is, give me an example, maybe of one way that you have worked with your students, something that you're teaching now, or even something that you've done, um, on yourself to, to get to the root. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of this, uh, the shadow work is, um, First, we look at, you know, what we're sort of uh, pushing away. So we look at what we suppress, right? Things that have never happened or things that we've repressed. So things that we push away um, or things that we are, you know, in denial or God forbid, we are lying to yourself. We are lying to ourselves and creating this different reality in order to function the mind. Um, so... For example, the work that, that I do um, through my clients and through my students is, um, you know, finding perhaps a trigger, right? Something that triggers them. Um, okay, so we, we know the trigger, we know what it is, but then how can we go to the trigger and change how we respond to the trigger, how do we change our reaction? Because that is, that's what we can ultimately change. No, that's the ultimate thing that we can actually go back and change and rewire our brains to sort of look at that trigger when it happens again, that we are in control of, of, of changing it and shifting it. So it no longer has this kind of weight over us. So for uh. example, um, 
you know, the trigger could be, I mean, it could be any, any basic thing where, you know, you're having an argument with uh, a person and all of a sudden a word that they say, it triggers something inside of you and you feel that maybe it's a sort of a past experience and you maybe react in a way that is explosive. But it wasn't maybe how they were saying it, but it was a remembering because I think ultimately we're all trying to remember what we have forgotten. So how can we kind of work with the triggers to make them um, work with us instead of um, instead of taking over us? So it's really about understanding the trigger. It's understanding the trauma, where it came from, how it happened, why it happened. Um, And then using tools as yoga, meditation, uh, prompt writing, journaling, connecting to, you know, spirit, again, walking backwards from the physical to the emotional, to the mental, to the spiritual, to come back to the sort of, I would say, you know, the Buddha nature, the compassion, the connection, and to come back to our higher selves, because we're all, we all have that Buddha nature, but we often forget it in that moment of trigger. We completely forget it. So how can we use that nature of being compassionate, being forgiving, being loving um, in those moments where we just sort of want to run away and we want to hide and we want to blame it it on, well, this is just the way I am. That's just the Mm -hmm. way I am and I'm not going to change. And so then that right there, the trauma is still going to follow you. The dark is still going to follow you. It's going to run your life, as Carl Jung would say, and you will call it, it's just my fate. So this is really about em- empowering the student or the client to take back their power. I love it. That was kind of uh, a mixed. long description. <laughs> no, that's great. And it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if we're talking about these um past experiences, be they in this life or in past generations or even past karmic lives, if you're looking at it from the Buddhist lens, then Mm -hmm. they can be very hidden. And as you said, you know, the conscious mind is filtering our experience at all times to feed us a certain perception that fits our idea of how things should go. And if that's the case, then we really need to be looking for clues to find that deep spiritual wound. And as you, you know, that trigger, the trigger that comes up, something that changes your physical, emotional, or mental state very quickly. I think that's always a powerful clue that something is underneath there. I believe that, you know, every symptom is the teacher. So the trigger is the teacher. So that's also something to, to kind of um, be curious about because you're having a symptom or you're having a trigger or you're having something that is happening on, on all levels or just an emotional or mental or physical level. So to get more curious about, you know, the symptom or the trigger as the teacher, because that is what's going to take you to the root cause. You know, um, the problem lies in, in, in the karmic pattern. So how can we sort of, you know, dissolve this karmic pattern, um, or just scratch karma out of it? How do we dissolve the pattern? How do we rewrite the habit? How do we um, reconnect with ourselves and make new habits and, 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 and new patterns that is ultimately going to help us um, thrive in our lives? And again, the whole power thing is coming back, but to really you know, be powerful in our lives, to take back that power and to ultimately heal ourselves from these things that we call, well, this is just me. The experience, what's happened to you, your experiences, yes, it's part of you, but is it really you? What happened to you? Is that really you? And who is the you? I mean, that's, you know, that's an entire different conversation of what is actually real, like what is real and the reality that we, that we, that we live in and that we see in, right? Like, do we just see things with our eyes? Like, for example, if right now I just made the sound, you know, woof, woof, right? What, what image do you get? right? You just got that image with your ears though. You didn't see it. So again, like what is real or things that we see, do we, do we ultimately have to see it to make it real? And that's what energy work is also 
you know, to do with that. Like, do you have to see, because it's like the chakras, no, it's like, you know, your, your whole, um, the energy wheels that go along the Sushumna Nadi that go along your spine. You can't cut someone's body and see your chakras. It's, it's, it's not going to happen, but you feel them and we talk about them and we know them and we connect with them. So again, the question of what is real, I don't know. So this all seems very helpful when we're talking about, you know, moving through hurt and pain that's acute that we can put a finger on as being it's it's possible to attribute it to a specific impression or impulse. But what about the the pain that's persistent, that's chronic, like negative self-talk, negative beliefs? How do we get to the source of that and overcome it? Yeah, I mean, um, well, I think, first of all, um, some of this is learned behavior. Um, and what I mean by that is it's things that we've learned from, you know, our, our parents, our caregivers, our, our family, things that we have learned as children, which then we take on into our adult life. So um, this is different, you know, chronic pain is different than like negative self-talk. So right now I'm referring to, you know, negative self-talk and the, and the dialogue that we have within ourselves that creates the pain. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but it is, I mean, it could first, it could create that emotional pain. Like I'm really depressed. I'm really, you know, I'm sad. I'm very unhappy, which then could, of course, then create a connection with a physical pain, right? Because it's the symptom. Everything is interconnected. So then you're having problems maybe in your chest, right? So, um, the, the, the hurt that we can create within ourselves or the, or the negative self-talk could also be a learned behavior. And it's also, you know, forget about maybe just your parents and the people that you grew up with, but maybe now, who are you surrounding yourself with now? Because everything again is contagious. So what we, we what we say to ourselves, where, where are we learning this behavior? You know, do we have friends that put us down? Do we have family that put us down? Um, and how do we get out of that negative self-talk is by doing the work. So the work of, and, you know, positivity, you could say, you know, you could sit there and, and tell yourself all these affirmations every day. It's not going to work. You could write all these mantras. I'm going to do this and repeat it 40 times for 40 days. Yes, it might work, but to change the dialogue of what you are experiencing in your mind, all the negativity, all the, the, the self, you know, the blame and the shame is, is first understanding how it got there, how, how it got there. And then the, the healing, Henry, healing happens, healing, healing has to happen with a person who really wants it. It's like also, I mean, like the placebo effect, right? How come some people take certain, you know, uh, pills, right? And then they get better. But the people who think that they're getting the same pill, but it's just a sugar pill, how do they heal? Because it's the power of the mind. They believe that they are healing. They believe that they are recovering. And so my interest is not on the pill that heals the person, but this sugar pill, this placebo effect that is creating the healing. And so, I mean, that in itself, the power of the mind and the power of the mind influencing the body. It's certainly a continuum. And that much is clear. I, I, I do find that it's, it's, quite interesting where this power comes from. I, I think about it often, the, the inherent ability of the body or mind or mind body continuum to heal itself. And, um, I, I wanted to ask you about that because of how you've broken down this whole, uh, stepwise kind of layering of the spirit to mental, to emotional, to physical. Do you have a feeling about where on that line our healing ability is coming from? Well, for, from my perspective, um, you know, it's, again, it's, these are all inter interconnected. They're all interconnected. So in order to, you need, it's like, it's like a tree, like a, tr a really sick tree. 
you can't just kind of cut the leaves of the tree and and just try to make it pretty or just water it a bunch or you know tell nice words to it love it you have if it's dying you have to take the the, the, the tree out of the root so that you can start to now plant uh, a new tree and what's probably happening happening to that tree is that the soil is infected mm. it's infested and so it's making the tree sick so you can try to make it pretty and you know you can cut the brown edges of the leaves and all of that stuff that could take you years and you're think yeah I'm going to get better I'm going to get better but ultimately the soil the foundation which then I would refer to as the spirit and that's that's where that's where you know from an energetic point of view from from you know from a from a dark and shadow uh, point of view is is the issue is in the soil the issue is in the foundation it's in the root so getting to the root cause which in this is is going back to the spirit it's his, it's a spirit retrieval mm. and when i speak about spirit it's not like ghosts or the church or all you know it's the spiritual connection you know we are spirit having this human experience yes i actually i love that metaphor and it really helped me to understand your your paradigm better because something that was kind of like not sitting well perfectly with me is the idea that a spirit could actually even have a problem to begin with. Uh, I mean, I personally believe that the spirit is immune to, to, um, trauma and pain and hurt. And in fact, anything that feels that way in our experience is in the human experience. And it's a matter of clouding that spirit. And the way that you described it with the roots being contaminated by dirty soil, that feels right. That feels right. And it's in the shadow. It's hidden. It the, the roots are still perfect, but it's something that's right around the spirit at the closest level where you can't see it and has to be dug up to to be excavated in order to be healed that seems right it is you know it's 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 the unknown and i think a lot of us are afraid of the unknown um because we, we're so we just want to know we want to know everything we want to know everything and so yes like you said this is really about entering the unknown it's entering that void it's entering things that have been hidden things that have been in the shadow waiting because you know what happens it just it sits there and it waits there and something happens in your life and that explodes and you have an incredible big reaction to it and then you must leave it because you're 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 not you don't have maybe the capability to handle what is happening because we're so scared to to face our trauma our trauma but it's like fear when you face fear when you look fear straight in the eyes that fear no longer has power so same thing with the unknown, with the trauma, with the shadow. When you look at it and say, okay, you know what? Bring it. When you have that confidence in you, that confidence in your healing, you look at that in the face, it has no longer any sort of power over you. So it's really, you know, this work is really about looking at, you know, what is, what is behind the corner? What is in the shadow? What is hiding? I mean, it's, it's, it's a yogic practice. I mean, that's what we do with, with our yoga poses. Every day it changes, you know? And, and, and we look at what is under the pose because the pose itself, I mean, yes, it means so much, but at the same time, what happens to you? What, who do you become when you're in the pose? So it's right, the same thing. Right. The pose is like a container for a specific experience. Yeah. So, okay, let's say we have, we've got something buried deep and we don't address it. Eventually, as you kind of alluded to, it'll bubble up. And at a certain point, it's an inevitable that it's going to expose itself as something potentially catastrophic if left unaddressed for a very long time. Do you find that we can mitigate or, I don't know, minimize the 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 negative effects of these traumas if somehow we're able to tap into them before they naturally come to the surface? Like, is there an advantage to finding it before it reaches some sort of pivotal moment? 
Well, that's a great question. I don't know if um, personally, you know, I'm still working on that. I don't think I can sense like a trauma coming like five minutes or 10 minutes before what I can sense, for example, for me personally, if I'm going to be around people that create um, a disturbance in my life, meaning I know, like I have a serious um, past relationship with them, right? Usually around, you know, people that are very close to me that can trigger me, that they know how to sort of, you know, um, kind of push my buttons. Do you ever have that? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So I know. Sometimes it's people who know you very well, and sometimes they're doing it completely incidentally. Yeah, exactly. So I know that I will probably have an experience that may be triggersome. So knowing that, I will, you know, prepare myself before the event where I'm like, okay, this is what you're going to do, B. You're going to breathe. You're not going to say anything. You're not going to react. You're going to smile. You're going to go back to that Buddha nature, right? Because I know in my past experience that that has happened and it will probably continue to happen until I change it. Because I know that I cannot change another person. And I have tried many, many times Many people, I have tried to change them, control them, and it does not work. And it's a lot of energy to do that to begin with. So when I know that that is coming, I then have the power to change that particular experience. And it has done wonders for me. Now, on the other hand, um, most of the time, I don't know. I don't know when it, it's going to come. And when it does come, my meditation practice truly helps me in, in, in knowing that, you know what, this is impermanent. I know this is impermanent. I know that this is temporary. So how can I just kind of watch what is arising, what is coming up? Okay, I can feel the symptom. I'm getting sweaty. Um, you know, I can feel my, my, my throat kind of locking. Um, I can feel the the beat of my heart getting a little bit more faster. I can, f these are the symptoms, right? These are, this is the teacher. This is what I'm talking about. The symptoms is the teacher. It's giving me a message. So I can e either listen to my teacher with all the tools that I have, or I can continue to ignore my teacher and do the thing that I do and just throw it at them and say, you know what? Yes, I'm angry. You made me do this. You made me angry. You did this. And it's this kind of um, vicious cycle. So it's all about taking responsibility. Now, we can sit here and say, you know, well, this person did, did this to me and I can never forgive them. If we're talking about that, first of all, forgiveness is not about them. It's, it's really about you. And we're not condoning their behavior at all. But what we're doing is we're taking back the power to come back to ourselves and to truly heal ourselves in a way that we feel really empowered. And looking at these symptoms, looking at these triggers, looking at, at the darkness as the teacher itself. You know, there's a, a beautiful ending that comes from Jiva Mukti Yoga, and it says something like, um, which I say a lot when I'm teaching, um, when we bring our hands together in Namaste, uh, we say, to thank all of our teachers that come in every shape and in every form, and to thank the teacher itself, life itself. So life is your teacher, your trauma is your teacher, your shadow is your teacher, everything is your teacher. Right, right. And it can only really be the teacher if you're willing to be the student. That's that's kind of the catch. Correct. Like if you and I and I found that's definitely true for me and my experience when, you know, when difficult emotions come up, whether it's fear or anxiety or or depression, all these kind of transient things that at the moment can feel totally consuming. That just like you said, if I face it, if I look straight at it, that helps me to. Yes, take ownership of it, but at the same time, not identify with it. Like I am experiencing this versus I am this. And right away that takes the power away from the experience and puts it back with me in the essence of me. Yeah. As you were saying that, I, I remembered um, a story about um, how you have to sort of swim, swim in this vastness ocean of life. And I'd love to actually share it with you. Please. So... The story, um, the story is of, of this philosopher 
this professor, um, he's on a ship and he's on the ship to give a conference and um, he's, he's pretty young, he's immature, but he has, you know, all these alphabets after his name and he's really smart, he's really educated, he's very young. And so he's on the ship and uh, on the ship there's also a sailor who is uh, a very old man. And uh, this, this old man, he, um, you know, he's, he's illiterate, he's never been to school, doesn't have education, but the ship is, is his life. He's a sailor. The ocean is his life. So one day the old man goes to, to, to listen to this professor and the, the professor is giving a talk. And at the, at the end of the talk, uh, the, the professor um, notices this, this old man and goes to the old man and says, hey, old man. Have you ever studied geology? And the old man looks at the professor and says, "No, sir. I've I've never studied uh, geology. I don't even know what that is. I've never gone to school. Please tell me what is that." And the professor says, "Oh, old man, geology is the study of 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 the earth." Oh, old man, I'm so sorry, you've wasted a quarter of your life. And so the old man is so sad and depressed and says, Oh, God, I've wasted, you know, a quarter of my life and goes back to his cabin. The next day, the old man comes again to hear this professor talk. And at the end of the talk, the professor once again sees the old man and calls him and says, Hey, old man, have you ever studied oceanology? And the old man says, oh, I have no idea what that is, sir. I've never gone to school. Um, please tell me, what is that? And the professor says, oh, old man, this is the study of, 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 the, of the ocean, the ocean that you're on. Poor old man, you've wasted uh, half of your life. And so the old man once again is disappointed in himself and depressed and goes back to his cabin. The third day, he comes back again to listen to the professor giving a talk. Once the talk is over, the professor sees the old man once again and says, Hey, old man, have you ever studied meteorology? And the old man says, Meteorology? Sir, I told you I've never been to school. I don't know what that is. Please tell me. And so the professor says, oh, old man, you've wasted three quarters of your life. Meteorology is the study of the wind and the rain and the weather. And so the old man once again is depressed and discouraged and goes back to the cabin. The fourth day is the old man's day. The fourth day, the old man comes rushing, running to this professor and says, Professor, sir, have you ever studied swimology? And the professor says, swimology? Oh no, I, I don't even know how to swim. And the old man says, oh, professor, I'm so sad for you. You have wasted all your life because right now there is a shipwreck and this ship is sinking. And so those who know how to swim will swim from the misery of this ship to the beauty across the shore. And those of them that don't know how to swim like you, well, you're just going to have to sink. So the moral of the story is we could have all of these logies, you know, and we could study endlessly and have all these alphabets, you know, behind, you know, in, in our names that just says we're a little bit more, you know, uh, studied more of the topic, but the, the actual swimology to swim in life, to partake in life from, you know, from one end to the other end, from misery, from suffering to liberation, that's all in our hands. So I think we all need to study swimology. We all need to know how to swim from the dark to the light. We must partake in the experience. We have to take this knowledge and use it, apply it to ourselves. Yeah. That's the hard part. Absolutely. That's the hard part. It's easy to have these conversations. It is. <laughs> Why? Why is it so hard? I know it's so easy to talk about it. Um, 
uh, but actual, you know, the doing part. But that's really, I think, Henry, where the change really happens is the action, because we could sit here and, you know, talk about talk about these things and philosophize it and argue it. And but I think, you know, taking the action just one step at a time, Mm -hmm. one step at a time, it's learning how to walk before you run. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, where we, we look at what is happening outside of us and we're like, you know, well, how do I, how do I even get out of bed? And people are talking, you know, about anxiety and depression, like it's just like the norm, but, you know, we can all experience anxiety and depression in different ways. Just like spirituality could mean very different, many different things to many different people. You know, um, but yes, why is it so hard? <laughs> Let's shift gears a little bit because earlier on in the conversation, you were going through some of the different ways that we can get into the shadow. And I don't want to skip over this. You you talked about shamanism and energy medicines. What is the difference in terms of um, what is the difference between doing independent work? on yourself through self-reflection or say meditation or yoga practice and having another guide you separate from say a a student teacher relationship where someone is, well, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to influence your answer. Yeah. So the, the, what happens when you do work individually self-study is that you are empowered. Okay, that's a huge, huge benefit for the psyche because it is working solo um, and it is deeply empowered to do the work. Now, when someone is working with you, so say a shaman, I am not a shaman, um, but I do, I have studied applied shamanism, which is very different from shamanism. So a shaman, what the shaman does, and if you ask any shaman why we cannot heal any shaman will tell you because people do not have connection to earth. They've lost the connection to earth, which is the source. So what the shaman does is the shaman goes into the underworld. So this is where the shaman does the heavy lifting for the client and the student and listens to the messages of her or his guide spirits and blows the power to the client. Okay. So in applied shamanism, Um, you empower the student or the client through an altered state of consciousness where you can guide them, whether it's visualization or meditation or, or anything that is energy work, um, to do the work themselves. So that's the difference. Now, the ingredient, the two ingredients, um, that will connect to, to, uh, spirit and energy is light work and sound. So light is the study of colors. It's kind of like also, you know, the the chakras Mm -hmm. and what the colors mean. And then of course, sound. So sound healing, which is becoming also very popular right now. Mm -hmm. So sound healing, not just in in instruments, not just the chimes or the kosher bells or the harmonium or or anything um, that is an instrument, but it's also vocal. So using your voice, so chanting is also an incredible way to shift the consciousness of the chanter. So those two things are really important in in energy medicine and connecting with the spirit is the light work and the sound healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea Um, of putting yourself into an altered state of consciousness is is appealing, right? Because if if our conscious mind is, is filtering out potentially these underlying issues that need to be healed, then it seems like a a nice solution to put yourself in a different conscious mind for a little while and see what else is available. Right. But you can also do that. So within, within, within the moment. So for example, right now, if my, my conscious mind, um, you know, is saying, okay, um, I'm feeling, I don't know, I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling tingles, or, um, you know, I'm about to give a speech and all I want to do is I want to run away because I feel fear. Right. So that's my, that's my conscious mind. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I know. How do I get into an altered state of consciousness 
within that moment. I'm not talking about, you know, this woo stuff and, you know, getting to this higher levels. It's within the moment. So using the tools that I have, okay, breathe. Breathe. Number one thing, breathe, breathe, breathe. Huge, huge, huge. And even now breath work everywhere, you know, it's blowing up because coming back to the breath, no one teaches you to breathe. You're not taught to breathe. And many students that I work with, many clients that I work with, they don't know how to breathe. So the first thing to change yourself and get yourself into that altered state of consciousness is to breathe, to breathe, breathing more from your diaphragm, less from your chest. So again, this is something that we learn, right? So then with the breath, you start to then feel a little more ease, right? So what happens then is that you shift to the nervous system. With the breath, with a regulated breath, the nervous system starts to downregulate. Your heartbeat starts to get a little bit slower. You are, you can still feel that fear of, I'm about to go on stage and do the speech, but I am working so consciously in altering my state to do the thing that truly fears me. So that's what I'm kind of talking about with the altered state of consciousness as well is within the moments how we can alter our state within the moment. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the breath yeah. is number one and it's also, guess what? Accessible to everyone. It's the essence of life and we all have it. It's just a matter of, are we conscious of it? I think that's what's so special about the breath is it does continue uh, ongoing for as long as we're alive, as long as your heart is beating, you're breathing, but we have the choice of whether to be conscious of it or let it be driven by the subconscious. And because of that, it's a gateway into understanding the subconscious. Yes, yes, it is. It's it's definitely a gateway. It's it's a, it's it's a doorway. I like to call these. You know, all of this is all portals. You know, like again, there is no right, wrong, or you need to do this this way. You know, this is all just information. And I think there's this vastness of information, especially you know, having the world wide web where we can just look. We want to know about something, and then there's this tons of information. It's like, again, what is real? But what I suggest is just practice it first. See if it works for you. You know, if you don't believe in sound healing, but why? Why don't, have you ever done sound healing? Have you ever chanted? Have you ever, you know, been in a place where you're, you know, serenaded with music and where you can relax and breathe? And so just, it's like trial and error. Go and try. Nothing, it's not going to hurt you to try. Try whatever helps you. Does journaling help you? Try that. Yoga, try that. You know, see what works for you. Because if you do things that that you're just going to not do them, it's never going to work. There's no discipline in that. So I think the key in really changing that is the discipline. And we learn that as yogis through the yoga practice, you know, to be really disciplined. Um, and that's what it is. It's, 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 it's a repetition. You want to change your life, you got to do this every single day, not just once a year, once a month. It is a repetition, you know, to take back the power that you've given and, and to truly heal from, from the inside out, to heal yourself because no one's going to heal you. And that's another thing. You can have amazing guides and facilitators and, and all of this, but no one can heal you but you. No one's going to rescue you. There is no rescue boat coming you got to rescue yourself. you got to take back the power that you've given to other people. You know, stop playing the victim game and celebrate yourself. And because we've got, you know, this life to live. And who knows if we're going to come back again, karma, incarnation, I don't know. But all I know is that we have this life right now. So why not make the most of it? You know, why not turn our shadows into the light? Bring light into the shadow. It's a beautiful uh, sentiment to end on, I think. I mean, yeah, you got to go out there and get the swimology degree. <laughs> you have to go try and put the put the practices to the test. And you're so right. I agree with you 100%. It's about discipline. Nothing nothing can save you with a, with a glancing try, with a brush through an experience. It has to be a commitment. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to commit to discipline on something on blind faith. You try different things. You try the sound healing. Maybe you try, you know, the, the the shamanic healing. And 
also the shaman is not going to heal you either, right? They give you an experience to work with, maybe open up some sort of new experience that it's your job then to integrate. But once you make the decision about what your practice is, it's on you to, to continue doing the work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what do you have coming up? Talk to uh, the Dharma talkers about uh, possible opportunities to do some of this deep shadow work with you. Yes, I have my women's healing immersion coming up in Oakville, Ontario, just outside of Toronto, uh, November 22nd to the 24th. It's a three-day really deep immersive uh, women's work. So we a lot of the things that I've talked about, we put that into practice. Um, in the new year, I have my intensive one-day immersion here in New York City, which is on January uh, 11th. 111 at the class in Tribeca. And I have my Bali retreat, my annual Bali retreat, which is happening April um, 11th to the 18th. Um, my Heal Yourself Method, which is a seven day deep dive into all of this uh, yoga, meditation, somatic, shadow, journaling, uh, chanting, and, and really uncovering and also recovering ourselves through this practice of discovery. Beautiful. Uh, sounds like a lot of fantastic opportunities for people, no matter what sort of level of commitment they're ready to make at this point, whether they're trying it out or ready to go, go deep. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Is Henry. there one last piece of advice or one last message you'd like to leave our audience with? You know, just to, again, live life, you know, live life the best that you can wake up every day, do the best that you can do all the things that make you happy, do all the things that bring meaning to your life. But at the same time, let yourself question everything, believe in the, the healing power of your practice, whatever your practice is, get up every day, do the best that you can and live this life, uh, through inspiration and, to go back and connect with yourself, with the part of you that might be feeling a little bit lost now and to remember that your life is your ultimate teacher. Your life is your ultimate teacher. Beautifully put. Can't say it any better than that. B, thank you so much for coming back on Dharma Talk. It's been amazing to talk with you. I'm sorry that we're no longer in the same city, but I trust that at some point we're going to cross paths again. So I'll see you sometime, someplace. See Until you. then, take care. See you soon, Henry. Bye-bye. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me, at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your dharma. <laughs>